So let's now look at the second part of this synapse. We know that a synapse is a communication between two cells. So we have the presynaptic neuron, the information sender, that will synapse with the postsynaptic neuron, the information receiver. So we see this in the central nervous system. Now what about in the peripheral nervous system? Well, a presynaptic cell is a presynaptic neuron, and it will synapse with a postsynaptic cell. So that postsynaptic cell could be another neuron, so therefore we call it a postsynaptic neuron, or it could be synapsing with the effector, or the gland, the muscle, the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, for example, and of course these are your postsynaptic cells. Now there are two types of synapses. We have the electrical synapses and the chemical synapses. So I'm just going to briefly mention the electrical synapses. We're not going to really talk about that as far as our discussion of synapses. You'll see this mostly in 224. So electrical synapses, which are rare, by the way, in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, involve gap junctions, all right? Those so-called communicating junctions that we talked about when we talked about cell-to-cell -cell junctions. And we find these gap junctions in cardiac muscle. So there will be a lot of gap junctions in cardiac muscle, and because we find these gap junctions, they have what's referred to as electrical synapses. So this is as far as we're going to go with electrical synapses. As I said already, this will be further discussed next semester when you talk about the heart. What we are going to focus on are the chemical synapses. So it's the most common type of synapse. It's between neuron to neuron and neuron to effector. It's unidirectional right, action potential traveling to the synaptic knob, and upon which we have the release of neurotransmitter. And that neurotransmitter then binds to the receptor found on the postsynaptic membrane, or we could also say the postsynaptic plasma membrane. And of course, we then generate a graded potential on the plasma membrane of the postsynaptic cell. In other words, the plasma membrane, the dendrites, the plasma membrane of soma, as well as the motor end plate of skeletal muscle. So if you go back to the notes of where we talked about muscle contraction, one of the things I had you memorize was that motor end plate, we generate a graded potential. All right, now we have what's called excitatory neurotransmitters versus inhibitory neurotransmitters. So what's the difference? Excitatory neurotransmitters promotes the generation of an action potential by causing depolarization. All right, so how does that work? Well, let's see. So I drew this graph, and here is my negative 70 millivolts. Once again, my resting membrane potential and threshold potential, negative 55. So when we say excitatory neurotransmitters, what that means is it's going to depolarize the plasma membrane of either the dendrite or the plasma membrane of the soma, all right? So that means the inner leaflet is made less negative. So it's moving up, all right? It's closer to that threshold potential, negative 55. So if it promotes depolarization, that means the closer we are to that negative 55 millivolts, that threshold potential that needs to be reached at that trigger zone in order to generate an action potential. Now, what about an inhibitory neurotransmitter? Well, this does the opposite. It suppresses the generation of an action potential at the trigger zone by causing hyperpolarization. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is we look back at this graph that I drew. Here's your negative 70 millivolts. So rather than depolarizing, instead we hyperpolarize. So in other words, we're increasing the negativeness of the inner leaflet. We're e making the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane of the dendrites and the plasma membrane of the soma more negative. So therefore, if it's more negative, the further we are from that negative 55 millivolts. So this all boils down to the type of ligand, the type of chemically gated channels that will open in response to the specific neurotransmitter, all right? Because once again, we are looking at plasma membrane of dendrites, plasma membrane of somas, so you need to think chemically gated, right? Not voltage gated, 
Remember, those voltage-gated channels are only found in the axolemma. Okay, so this should look hopefully fairly familiar to you. Here is my synaptic end bulb, my synaptic knob of the uh, presynaptic neuron. So this is right over here, right? So this is all presynaptic neuron. And so what this image is, is just enlarging one of the synaptic knobs or synaptic end bulb of this presynaptic neuron. So we already know that the nerve action potential arrives at the, uh, or nerve impulse arrives at the synaptic knob. Here are those voltage-gated calcium channels that open in response to the arrival of that action potential. So now that these voltage-gated calcium channels open, calcium enters the synaptic knob or the synaptic end bulb, and now we have exocytosis of these synaptic vesicles or secretory vesicles, and they're packed with neurotransmitters. So then what happens? We have exocytosis. Out goes the neurotransmitter. Now, what determines if this neurotransmitter is inhibitory or excitatory? Well, it depends upon the type of ligand-gated or chemically-gated channels that will open in response to that neurotransmitter. All right, so what we're looking at here, folks, is the postsynaptic membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. So this example is giving us a postsynaptic neuron as the postsynaptic cell. So in this example, this is showing us a ligand-gated sodium channel. So this neurotransmitter opens a ligand-gated sodium channel, which I hope you see is found in this postsynaptic membrane. Well, folks, it's not the only type of ligand-gated channels that we find on this postsynaptic membrane. We could have ligand-gated potassium channels and ligand-gated chloride ion channels as well. So it boils down to what type of ligand-gated or chemically-gated channels will open in response to that specific neurotransmitter that will determine whether or not that neurotransmitter is excitatory or inhibitory. So on this bottom of the slide, I really want to talk about this because this is really important, okay? The higher the frequency of the action potential, which of course we know that means we have a stronger stimulus, right? We discussed this already. The more action potentials arriving at the synaptic knob, that means the greater number of synaptic vesicles will exocytose their contents. What exactly are their contents? These neurotransmitters. So if we really increase the frequency of action potential, the more synaptic vesicles release this neurotransmitter. Another thing I need you to remember is the effect of the neurotransmitter depends upon the receptor, all right? That receptor, what does that receptor do? Does it open a ligand-gated sodium channel? Does it open a ligand-gated potassium? Or does it open a ligand chloride channel? That will determine whether or not that neurotransmitter is inhibitory or excitatory. So steps five, six, and seven, I will illustrate that out in the next slide. Okay, now when we talk about postsynaptic potentials, we are talking about graded potentials on the postsynaptic membrane. What postsynaptic membrane are we referring to? Well, we're referring to the postsynaptic membrane specifically of the dendrites and the soma. So once again, this is plasma membrane of dendrites, plasma membrane of soma, all right? So the graded potential, the postsynaptic potential, will depend upon the amount of neurotransmitter that is released and the time that the neurotransmitter remains in the area, as well as the type of ligand-gated channels that open in response to that neurotransmitter. Don't forget what we just discussed in the last slide. We have three types of ligand-gated, right? We've got ligand-gated sodium, ligand-gated potassium, and ligand-gated 
chloride ion channels that are found in the plasma membrane of the dendrite and the plasma membrane of the soma, these postsynaptic membranes. All right, so we have two types of postsynaptic potentials. Uh, the excitatory postsynaptic potential, EPSP, or inhibitory postsynaptic potential, IPSP. Once again, I needed to think graded potential that's happening at the plasma membrane of the soma, plasma membrane of the dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron, just so that you don't get confused what's happening here. So this, this is all about the postsynaptic neuron's membrane, right? Plasma membrane of soma, plasma membrane of dendrites. All right, so excitatory postsynaptic potential. Let's look at the first one. This is graded depolarization caused by neurotransmitter binding to postsynaptic membranes that results in the opening of ligand-gated sodium channels. I'm going to highlight that. All right, so what's going on here? Well, let's see. Let's refer to the illustration that I did on the right side. All right, so once again, these arrows are indicating these ligand-gated channels. So arrows mean ligand-gated channels. So we're looking at this one right over here. All right, so your neurotransmitter has opened ligand-gated sodium channels at the postsynaptic plasma membrane of the neuron, dendrite soma. All right, so if that neurotransmitter opens ligand-gated sodium channels, I hope you see that the inner leaflet is going to be made less negative. Now, why will the inner leaflet be made less negative? Because we have positive charges in the form of sodium that's coming in. So if the inner leaflet is made less negative, then I hope you see that the closer we're going to get to negative 55 millivolts at the trigger zone of that postsynaptic neuron. So I quickly drew this graph once again, just so that we can uh, illustrate this and you can see what's happening. So once again, neurotransmitter has now opened the ligand-gated sodium channels on the postsynaptic neuron. So therefore, here is my negative 70 millivolts. What's going to happen? It's going to depolarize, right? So basically, we are now getting closer to negative 55 millivolts, which means now we are going to probably produce an action potential at the trigger zone of that postsynaptic neuron. So therefore, anytime a neurotransmitter opens ligand-gated sodium channels, that neurotransmitter is excitatory. All right, I repeat, that neurotransmitter is excitatory. What happens at the postsynaptic neuron we generate an excitatory postsynaptic potential, EPSP. All right, now what about an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, IPSP? All right, well, what if a neurotransmitter opens instead, right, neurotransmitter released into the synaptic cleft by the presynaptic neuron, it binds to its receptor on the postsynaptic membrane of that neuron, but instead of opening ligand-gated sodium channels, it opens instead ligand-gated potassium channels or opens ligand-gated chloride ion channels. Now what's going to happen? Well, here are my illustrations. So here is your ligand-gated potassium channels indicated with the red arrow and the ligand-gated chloride ions indicated with the blue arrow. All right, so what in the world's happening? Well, if ligand-gated potassium channels open, potassium leaves the neuron. Why? Because it's following its concentration gradient. So now what happens to that inner leaflet? Positive charges are leaving, folks. Therefore, that inner leaflet is going to be made more negative. So rather than approaching negative 55, we're getting further away from it. We're hyperpolarizing. So if we go back to this graph, the, rather than going up the scale, we are going down, right? So basically, hyperpolarization is happening. So now, when you're at the trigger zone, we are further away from negative 55. 
So we are not probably going to generate an action potential. It's too far from negative 55. All right, now what about if the neurotransmitter opens ligand-gated chloride ions instead? All right, that can be also found at the postsynaptic neurons membrane. So if those channels open, chloride ion enters the cell. Why? Because again, the concentration gradient of the chloride ions that I asked you to memorize. So chloride ion enters the neuron. Well, chloride ions are negatively charged. Obviously, I hope you see that the inner leaflet will definitely be made more negative, right? You're introducing negative chargedness in the form of these chloride ions. So what happens to the inner leaflet of the postsynaptic neuron? It's going to hyperpolarize. So that means we are once again further away from negative 55. So the likelihood of generating an action potential at that trigger zone of that postsynaptic neuron will probably not occur. You're further away from negative 55. So that is referred to as an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, IPSP. It's graded hyperpolarization. All right, so if that occurs, the neuron is said to be inhibited. It's going to be less likely that it's going to generate an actual potential at the trigger zone because the further we are from that negative 55 at that trigger zone. So if we look at this image below, here's my negative 70, and you can see the EPSP. Remember, this is all about the postsynaptic neuron's membrane, right? Membrane of dendrite, membrane of soma. And here is your IPSP. Take note, we are closer to negative 55 by depolarizing EPSP, and we're further away from, neg uh, from negative 55 if we are IPSP. Now, what happens if we have both, uh, IPSP and EPSP? It cancels each other out as if nothing has happened. And you'll see an image of that later on. So let's talk about summation at postsynaptic neuron. So a single EPSP cannot induce an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. However, if we have a bunch of these EPSPs that are added together, which is called summation, it increases the probability of reaching threshold potential, negative 55 millivolts at the trigger zone of that postsynaptic neuron. Now keep in mind, Summation may occur for both EPSP, IPSPs, or both, all right? So I'll explain that as well. Keep in mind that most neurons receive both stimulatory and inhibitory inputs from thousands of other neurons. So often when we talk about these synapses, you're thinking that one neuron synapses with another neuron. That is true, but we could have a postsynaptic neuron in which a bunch of presynaptic neurons are synapsed to that postsynaptic neuron. So in other words, right over here, all right? So in this particular case, here is this one postsynaptic neuron, and we've got two presynaptic neurons. And this is what we usually find. And this is just few. I mean, we could have thousands of these presynaptic neurons synapsing with that one postsynaptic neuron. So basically, this is all about the effects, what are the added effects of these presynaptic neurons is what this summation is all about. All right, so we have the first type of summation called spatial summation, all right? So just so that we're clear, I hope everyone agrees, this is my postsynaptic neuron, right? So my postsynaptic neuron. All right, now what about these? I'll highlight it. So, well, let me use my orange. All right, so what about this one and this one? What are those? Well, those are axons from two different presynaptic neurons, all right? So we've got neuron number one and neuron number two. So this is just further reemphasizing what I just said, that we could have many, many presynaptic neurons synapsing with one postsynaptic neuron, as you see right here. All right, so what spatial summation is all about is what if both these presynaptic neurons simultaneously fire an action potential, right? So they both send action potentials at the same time, arriving at their synaptic 
and bulb or synaptic knob of which neurotransmitter is released. All right, so neurotransmitter is released by this neuron, neurotransmitter is released by this neuron. Well, it happens to be EPSPs, excitatory postsynaptic potential that occurs on the plasma membrane of this postsynaptic neuron. All right, so we can see it here. So neurotransmitter is released by neuron number one, neurotransmitter is released by neuron number two. So what this is illustrating, instead of simultaneous firing of action potential where they're both firing at the same time, you could see here the fact that they're not simultaneously firing is why we don't generate an action potential. However, if they simultaneously fire an action potential, we're going to hit threshold at that postsynaptic potential trigger zone. So the key thing here is they fire together. If they fire at the same time, that's called spatial summation, which means it is more likely for this postsynaptic neuron to generate an action potential at its trigger zone. So the second type of summation is referred to as temporal summation. So rather than having multiple presynaptic neurons firing at the same time, what we have instead is one presynaptic neuron firing in rapid successions. In other words, one presynaptic neuron is firing many, 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 many action potentials and many, many action potentials arriving at the synaptic knob. Therefore, lots and lots and lots of neurotransmitter is exocytose into the synaptic cleft. So here is my postsynaptic neuron and here is the axon of the presynaptic neuron, all right? So let's say it just fires one action potential, which could, we could see with this graph. This is not enough to reach that negative 55 at the trigger zone of the postsynaptic neuron, therefore no action potential. Now, what if it fires one more time? Well, it's still not enough, all right? We're not hitting that negative 55 at the trigger zone of this postsynaptic neuron. So what if, for example, the presynaptic neuron increases the frequency of that action potential? So now it's in rapid fire, right? So it's firing all that action potential and look at what happens. So with each firing of action potentials, more and more and more neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic cleft. So now threshold is reached at the trigger zone of the postsynaptic neuron. So I like this image on the bottom because this just reiterates what I was saying. So here is once again my one postsynaptic neuron and look at how many presynaptic neurons are synapsed with this one neuron. We see the red and the red means IPSP on that postsynaptic neuron. We see the green means EPSP on that postsynaptic neuron. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Let's consider this right here. All right, so there's my presynaptic neuron and it's generating an IPSP on that postsynaptic neuron. So therefore, the neurotransmitter that is released by that one presynaptic neuron must have opened ligand-gated potassium channels or must have opened ligand-gated chloride ions. Therefore, instead of depolarizing the plasma membrane of the postsynaptic neuron, Instead, it's going to hyperpolarize the plasma membrane of this neuron, specifically the dendrite, the plasma membrane of the dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so now let's look at this one over here, all right, right there. All right, so we could see the green, therefore EPSP on this postsynaptic neuron. So therefore, this particular presynaptic neuron must have released or exocytosed a neurotransmitter that opens ligand-gated sodium channels on the plasma membrane of the dendrite of this postsynaptic neuron. Therefore, we generate an EPSP on this postsynaptic neuron. So whether or not this neuron will generate an ASHA potential boils down to how many EPSPs and how many IPSPs arrive that postsynaptic neuron. So in other words, if we end up with more EPSP than IPSP, then therefore at the trigger zone of this postsynaptic neuron, negative 55 is reached 
action potential is generated by this postsynaptic neuron. However, if there are more IPSPs rather than EPSPs, then instead of generating an action potential at the trigger zone of this postsynaptic neuron, instead the neuron is inhibited. Therefore, no action potential is generated at the trigger zone. Negative 55 millivolts was not reached at the trigger zone of this postsynaptic neuron. So these are just two additional images of uh, spatial summation and temporal summation. So take a look at the top picture. I think it does a decent job explaining what we just went over. Now, if we look at the bottom picture, it's basically the same thing. This time, however, uh, we have this one right over here. So let's look at that for just a second. All right, so this is where we have two presynaptic pre neurons, synapse with this one postsynaptic neuron. One is generating an EPSP indicated by the green, and the other presynaptic neuron is generating an IPSP, which is indicated by the red. So let's say both simultaneously fires. So that means action potential arrives at their synaptic knobs and they release neurotransmitters. So if this releases a neurotransmitter and this releases a neurotransmitter. All right, so folks, if this is green, that means we generated an EPSP on that postsynaptic neuron. Therefore, the neurotransmitter released by this presynaptic neuron that's labeled E1 must have been an excitatory neurotransmitter. Therefore, it must have opened ligand-gated sodium channels on this postsynaptic neuron. Now, what about this neuron that's labeled I1? Well, the fact that it's red tells us it's IPSP on that postsynaptic neuron. Therefore, the neurotransmitter that it's released at its synaptic knob must have been an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So therefore, that inhibitory neurotransmitter must have either opened a ligand-gated potassium channel or a ligand-gated chloride ion channel. Instead of an EPSP, we generated an IPSP on that postsynaptic neuron. So once again, if they both simultaneously fire, then what happens? Well, we cancel, all right? Nothing happens. Basically, it's as if neither one of them fired in the first place. They cancel each other out. So this goes back to that whole summation thing that I was talking about, that if we end up with more EPSPs, then that neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, will generate an action potential. If we have more IPSPs, then that postsynaptic neuron will be inhibited. No action potentials will occur at their trigger zone.